Let's start off with a verse for today. Let me minimize the, yeah, okay. Let's start off with a verse for today. Shrivat Bhagavatam 8.8.9. Asyam chakru spriyam sarve sa sura asura manavaha rupa audarya vayo varna vahima kshipta chetasaha Asyam unto her chakru chakru who did spriham desire sarve everyone sa sura asura manavaha the demigods, the demons, and the human beings. Rupa Audarya, by the exquisite beauty and bodily features. Vayaha, youth. Varna, complexion. Mahima, glories. Akshipta, agitated. Chetasaha, their minds. Translation. Because of her exquisite beauty, her bodily features, her youth, her complexion and her glories. Everyone, Rama. including the demigods, Rama. the demons and the human beings desired her. They were attracted because she is the source of all opulences. Before we read the purport, I should have started out with Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. We can chant together Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. So reading from Srila Prabhupada's purport, who in this world does not want to possess wealth, beauty, and the social respectability that come from these opulences? People generally desire material enjoyment, material opulence, and the association of aristocratic family members. Bhoga Aishwarya Prasaktana. Material enjoyment entails money, beauty and the reputation they bring, which can all be achieved by the mercy of the goddess of fortune. The goddess of fortune, however, never remains alone. As indicated in the previous verse by the word Bhagavat Para, she is the property of the Supreme Personality of Godhead and is enjoyable only by him. If one wants the favor of the goddess of fortune, Mother Lakshmi, because she <coughs> is by nature Bhagavad Para, one must keep her with Narayan. I introduced the uh, bolding in here. Purport continued, the devotees who always engage in the service of Narayan, Narayan Parayana, can easily achieve the favor of the goddess of fortune without a doubt. But materialists who try to get the favor of the goddess of fortune only to possess her from personal enjoyment, are frustrated. Theirs is not a good policy. The celebrated demon, Ramana, for example, wanted to deprive Ramachandra of Lakshmi, Sita, and thus be victorious. But the result was just the opposite. Sita, of course, was taken by force by Lord Ramachandra, and Ravana and his entire material empire were vanquished. The goddess of fortune is desirable for everyone, including human beings. But one should understand that the goddess of fortune is the exclusive property of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. One cannot achieve the mercy of the goddess of fortune unless one prays both to her and to the Supreme Enjoyer, the Personality of Godhead. And the purport will um, go back and read the translation once. Because of her exquisite beauty, her bodily features, her youth, her complexion, and her glories, everyone, including the demigods, the demons, and the human beings desired her. They were attracted because she is the source of all opulences. <clears throat> Om Ajnana Timirandasya Gyananjana Shalakaya Chakshurun Litam Yena Tasmai Shri Guruve Namaha Mukam Karoti Vachalam Pangum Langayate Grim Yatkripa Tamaham Bande Shri Guru Dintai Namam Vishnapadaya Krishna Prishtaya Bhutale Srimate Bhakti Vidanta Swami Vidane Namaste Saraswati Deve Gauravani Pracharane Nirvishe Shushun Vivadi Paschatya Deshatarane Jaya Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadhar 
ಶಿವಾಸ ವಿಧೋರ್ಭಕ್ತವೃಂದ ಹರಿ ಕೃಷ್ಣ ಹರಿ ಕೃಷ್ಣ 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 ಹರಿ 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 ರಾಮ ಹರಿ ರಾಮ 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 ಹರಿ ಹರಿ ಜಯ ರಾಮ ಕಿ ಜಯ ಮೈ ಒಬೇಸನ್ಸ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಗ್ರಾಟಿಟ್ಯೂಡ್ ಟು ದಿ ಅಸೆಂಬಲ್ಡ್ ವೈಷ್ಣವಸ್ ಎಸ್ಪೆಷಲಿ ಆದಿ ಪುರುಷ ಪ್ರಭು ಹೂ ಇಸ್ ಲೈಕ್ ಅ ರಾಕ್ ಅಟ್ ದ ಭಕ್ತಿ ಸೆಂಟರ್ ಸೀನಿಯರ್ ಡಿಬೋಡಿ ಸೋ ಮೆನಿ ಡೆಕೇಡ್ಸ್ ಆಫ್ ಇನ್ಸ್ಪಿರೇಷನ್ ಗೋಯಸ್ ಪ್ರಾಪರ್ ಜಯ ಪ್ರಾಪರ್ um so this chapter is talking about the churning of the milk ocean and uh this specific verse and actually the verse that uh, namras prabhu talked on yesterday uh talks about rama devi or lakshmi devi and her glories and her opulences <laughs> so it's interesting to see what rama devi's relationship is with the lord so i wanted to turn to a couple of different references uh the first one is in the 68th chapter of the 10th canto of shrimad bhagavatam or krishna book there are verses that are uttered by lord balaram to the kurus and the background to that story is that krishna's son samba had gone to hastinapur and kidnapped the daughter of duryodhan her name was lakshmana and as he was taking her away from uh, from hastinapur from her swayamvar actually the marriage uh, ceremony where the bride selects or the girl selects a bridegroom um the kurus chased him and chased them overpowered him and instead of fighting with him one on one they fought with him many on one they overpowered him and took him back as a prisoner so the yadavas in dwarka when they heard this they were furious and they wanted to march on kuru on uh, the kuru kingdom and destroy it but balaram said let me go pacify them so balaram goes to hastinapur to pacify the kurus and he says very sweetly and mildly you know uh, we are related why don't you hand back uh, samba and marry him off to uh, lakshmana and the kurus who are intoxicated by material opulence uh, they insult the yadavas they insult krishna and they insult balaram and so balaram gets very furious and wants to destroy hastinapur so before he starts using his plow to drag hastinapur into the ocean he points out two there are two verses 36 and 37 where he points out the glories the greatness of krishna's lotus feet so verse 36 he points out that the goddess of fortune herself the ruler of the entire universe worships krishna's lotus feet and in verse 37 lord balaram says she that is goddess rama along with lord balaram himself are simply parts of his spiritual identity that is krishna's spiritual identity and we also carefully carry that dust on our heads so this starts to give us give us a glimpse of rama devi the second um reference that i wanted to bring in is the nectar of devotion chapter 22 which explains or continues the explanation of krishna's qualities so in that chapter qual- quality number 53 is that krishna is ever fresh under that Srila Rupa Goswami explains all the queens at Dwarka were goddesses of fortune it is said in Shrimad Bhagavatam first canto 11th chapter verse 33 that the goddesses of fortune are very fickle and restless so no one can consistently captivate them thus one's luck will always change sometime yet the goddesses of fortune could not leave krishna for even a moment when they were residing with him at dwarka this means that krishna's attraction is ever fresh even the goddesses of fortune cannot leave his company so we find in this world um, and i've experienced it myself in my own life there is constantly ups and downs and changes happen we get comfortable in a particular situation and then uh material nature it's the it's the nature of material energy to be uh changing and fickle and in this material world most people think that 
opulence and money is what Lakshmi Devi or Rama Devi is all about. So we'll see as we go further how far from the truth that is. So we are aware of what this churning of the milk ocean is all about. Lord Vishnu had advised the demigods to make peace with the demons to take part in a churning of the milk ocean so that they could come up with the nectar of immortality. <coughs> now, many things come out, right? Um, before, before Rama Devi comes out, uh, the most unbelievable poison comes out. Lord Shiva um, compacts it into a tiny amount and swallows it and holds it in his throat, actually. Um, then the Surabhi cow comes out, then Uchayshrava, the horse comes out, then Airavat and the eight uh, wonderful elephants come out that can go in any direction. Then uh, the Kastuba gem and um, another gem, I forgot the name, come out where Lord Vishnu takes those. And then Ramadevi comes out of the milk ocean. And her opulences are described in this verse. Ramadevi is eternally the consort of Vishnu. It's not that she appears from the churning of the milk ocean and that's when she becomes his consort. She's eternally his consort. But her appearance from the churning of the milk ocean is one of her pastimes. And the verse that we read today talks about Spriham Sarve. Everyone desires the favor of Lakshmi Devi. So there is a story that Srila Prabhupada told um, in Bengal, two men were talking to each other and one of them asks, how intelligent are you? And the other man suddenly started, I don't know if you can see my pocket, but suddenly started checking his <laughs> everywhere. And uh, the, other, the first person goes, what are you doing? I asked you how intelligent you are. Are you checking your pockets? And the second person replied, yes. How intelligent I am will be reflected in how much money I have. So today, money and opulences are considered the perfection of life. We, we all know that. But it's interesting, the Shastras tell us unequivocally that Lakshmi Devi or Lakshmi does not mean money or opulences. One's opulences are Lakshmi Devi only if engaged in Krishna's service. But if they're engaged in serving just oneself, or one's family, one's nation, and so on, they actually take the form of Durga. And Durga, as we know, is the controller of material energy. And her job is to keep the living entities who are inimical to Krishna imprisoned in the material world till they learn their lesson and surrender to Krishna. And they start living a life of surrender and offering to Krishna. So the verse describes if one is Narayan Parayan, or engaged in Krishna's service, then one is safe. However, if one is Lakshmi Parayana, that is, one tries to engage in the service of Lakshmi without engaging in Krishna's service, then the end result will be nothing but frustration. So we see these instances everywhere in the material world. You know, someone wins a lottery for a hundred million dollars, five years later they are broke, or relations that they didn't know existed came out of the woodwork and pestered them for a share of the money. Churches and charities come out of the woodwork. Then the lottery winner himself, you know, gambles away the money or buys all kinds of so-called toys, boats, houses, things like that. And then five years later, he's broke. Um, so that's because he's trying to engage that money and that opulence in his own service. And maybe he'll enjoy it some, you know, not everyone goes broke. Maybe he'll enjoy it for the rest of his life. But at the end of his life, he will still have to give it up. <clears throat> and he will be attached and the result will be frustration. Like, why can't I enjoy? I am getting old and I'm, you know, my riches are being taken away from me. I'm dying. So that is the inevitable result when uh, the opulences are sought to be engaged in one's own service. Um, I grew up in India. And in India, a big festival is Lakshmi Puja. So anyone who's been to India during Diwali or Kartik will have seen this, or if they grew up in India, they will have seen this, that there are people in India who will worship all kinds of forms of the Supreme or what they think is forms of the Supreme. 
they'll even worship sticks and stones and trees and without real knowledge of the scriptures. Um, or they'll worship demigods thinking that there's no difference between worshiping the demig a demigod and worshiping Krishna, the Supreme. But everyone in India is agreed on one thing, that Lakshmi Pujan is really, really important. And I, re I remember growing up, this was like the biggest thing. Everyone would be excited and they would perform elaborate Lakshmi Pujan and all the prayers would be like, Lakshmi Devi, please bless me and my family with prosperity, with health, with good fortune. And in many parts of India, so I lived in Northern India for a few years, um, in many parts of India, right after they do Lakshmi Pujan with great reverence, you know, the bottle of whiskey comes out, then gambling starts because it's a big day for gambling. And then who knows all kinds of other unmentionable activities start including food and other activities which we as devotees obviously do not partake of. So that is Lakshmi Pujan, but that's not really the idea of worshipping Lakshmi or that's not the right way to worship Lakshmi. If we think about it in a cultured society, a lady will not go alone to someone's house, to some other man's house. What mm -hmm. to think of the Supreme Lord's consort. So when we pray to Lakshmi Devi or the vast majority of people pray to Lakshmi Devi, and they're praying for her to come to their house, but they really don't care about Narayan or Krishna. That's like inviting Lakshmi Devi to come without her husband. So how is she gonna to come to your house without her husband? She's not gonna to go to the life or to the home of someone who cares only for her, who only desires her, but not her husband. That, as the purport describes, is the policy of demons like Ravana. So yeah, we don't have you know, power like Ravana, but if we have desires that, yeah, you know, I want Lakshmi Devi, but it's a little inconvenient to have Narayan come along too. There's so many rules and regulations. You have to give up these things and I really want to just enjoy. Well, it's not going to happen. She's very fickle. She does not like going alone to the house of someone who's not worshiping her husband. And if she does go on a visit, she will leave pretty soon because her job is to be with her. Her joy is to be with her husband. And wherever her husband is being worshipped, she takes great joy. Um, Sri Radhika and I are currently reading Brihad Bhagavatam Rita together. And the Brihad Bhagavatam Rita describes uh, the journey of Gopakumar. And as part of his journey, he's gone to Satyaloka where Lord Brahma lives. And there is a Vaikuntha planet on Satyaloka where Krishna or Narayan lives along with Lakshmi Devi. And it's described how Gopakumar ecstatically worships um, Lord Narayan. And Lakshmi Devi sees that and she feels so affectionate, protective and motherly towards Gopakumar. She's stroking his head and she's caressing him because he faints in ecstasy. She just treats him like her own son. So that is how Lakshmi Devi views anyone who worships her husband. So I wanted to bring in one more reference, um, and this time an article that Srila Prabhupada wrote in 1956 in his Back to Godhead magazine. So Srila Prabhupada wrote the following words, as a result of the impulse for sense gratification, money is earned by spoiled energy, and it is then spent for the destruction of the human race. The energy of the human race is thus spoiled by the law of nature because that energy is diverted from the service of the Lord who is actually the owner of all energies. Wealth derives from Mother Lakshmi or the goddess of fortune. As the Vedic literatures explain, the goddess of fortune is meant to serve Lord Narayan, the source of all the Naras or living beings. The Naras are also meant to serve Narayan, the Supreme Lord, under the guidance of this goddess of fortune. The living being cannot enjoy the goddess of fortune without serving Narayan or Krishna. And therefore, whoever desires to enjoy her wrongly will be punished by the laws of nature. And the money itself will become the cause of destruction instead of being the cause of peace and prosperity. 
So Prabhupada uses the term desires to enjoy her wrongly, which means to in, try to enjoy the opulences without offering them in service to Krishna. <clears throat> so enjoying without the Supreme Lord is the program of the material world. Srimad Bhagavatam is presenting the only viable path to happiness. As you heard in yesterday's purport, the first prerequisite of wealth, uh, the first prerequisite for peace is that all the wealth presented by Sri, the goddess of fortune, should be offered to the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Everyone should give up his false proprietorship over worldly possessions and offer everything to Krishna. This is the teaching of the Krishna consciousness movement. Now let's be honest, most of us, and I will probably exclude Adi Purusha Prabhu from this because he is totally surrendered. But most of us, you know, this does not sound practical. It actually sounds quite frightening because, you know, we, we are grihastas, we have, you know, families to maintain, houses and cars and so on. So what does that mean that, you know, I should offer all the opulence that is presented by Sri for the service of Krishna? Well, there's a couple of points that I wanted to discuss. So one is, you know, let's examine the alternative. Is there a practical solution in the material scheme of things? And we've seen from the examples I mentioned before that everyone's constantly in this world, everyone's constantly thinking of money, how to get it, how to keep it, what to do with it so that it multiplies, how to protect it from robbers, thieves, the government, you know, in the form of, undue taxation and so on. But the alternative to that is, yes, our goal is every single thing we have to be offered to the service of Krishna. And we may not be there yet. And obviously we should start in the first place by being honest about where we are. But if we make our life itself an offering to Krishna, in other words, we give priority to our spiritual life, um, here and chant, nicely as per the vows we have taken in front of our spiritual masters and uh, Agni Dev and the Supreme Personality of God at Krishna. Uh, we start with that. We raise a family or we maintain a family with integrity. Um, so we take what is necessary for living a life that is comfortable for us, but not necessarily just focused and exclusively devoted to material enjoyment. We give some donations to the temple for preaching of Mahaprabhu's movement. Um, we help programs like Adi Purusha Prabhu's Food for Life program, which feeds Prasad to so many people every day. Um, and we try and use what has been given to us, the time, the energy, the youth, the opulences, uh, our connections to serve Krishna, bring other people to Krishna, serve the devotees. Then that's a start to becoming surrendered to Krishna. Yes, it's not fully, it may not be 100% utilization as the previous verses purport talks, but it's definitely a start. And if we always keep that ideal in front of us, that that's where we want to go, then Krishna will arrange our life in such a way that we start progressing towards that ideal. And also leading a life that is devoted to Krishna, that Krishna, I am trying to become your fully surrendered devotee. That then means that everything we do, our job, our maintenance of our family, um, anything you know that we talk, we eat, that becomes an offering to Krishna. It becomes part of devotion service and it starts purifying us. So I wanted to suggest that, and you know, I'll leave some time at the end for comments, questions, and so on. Um, we see that the demons get frustrated when they do not get the mercy of Ramadevi. But Krishna fulfills everyone's desires. Materially, those desires are fulfilled as per the living entity's karma. So I remember uh, in my very early days when I had, um, just moved to New York from Arizona and I was a new devotee. I'm still a new devotee. I'm still trying, but I was a newer devotee then. Um, I heard a lecture by Eka Chakra Prabhu, who was my first Bhagavatam guru. And he said something that stayed with me ever since. He said, the only purpose of super soul is to fulfill the desires of the living entity. 
And that struck me as really far out, like, hey, aren't we using SuperSoul as a survey? But over time, as I've done more hearing and more reading, gradually the purport of what he said has started dawning on me. And that is that super soul exists as a sanctioner. So to the extent that we have desires to enjoy separately from Krishna, then super soul will sanction those desires, but it will be within the sphere of karmic give and take. So if something is due to us, then it'll come to us. If something is not, then it won't. And we'll get frustrated. Um, but if we have spiritual desires, have you noticed like every single devotee that I know of has some instances that they can point to that they wanted to do something specific for Krishna, some service, and there were different obstacles. They didn't see how it could happen. Could be something as simple as, hey, my boss said you have to stay late today and the Radhashtami program is starting at 6.30 and I'm supposed to chant Kirtan there, you know, at, at the beginning and now I don't know how to do it. And magically, something opens up and you know, the work gets done or the boss says, you know, fine, let's do it tomorrow. And you end up at the temple and you're actually able to lead that kirtan at 6.30. So that's a small instance, but we see that the desires we have shape the reality of what our life becomes. And so to the extent that our desires are spiritual, then we come under the control of the Daivi Shakti or the divine energy, not under the control of the material energy. So we see that the demons in the churning of the milk ocean, they get frustrated because they want Rama Devi, but they don't get her. So what comes next is Varuni or the goddess of intoxication. And the demons get her and they are happy or so they think. See, that's the material arrangement. When desires are frustrated, human beings either get depressed or they turn to intoxication or both. And we see that happening in the Bhagavatam again and again. So what is Rama Devi's actual favor? For a devotee, the blessing of Lakshmi Devi is the ability, desire, and enthusiasm to push forward in their bhakti or devotional service to Krishna, no matter the material circumstances. That is her real blessing. So yes, we see the Bhagavatam deals again and again with the question of, uh, or the, the point of opulences uh, as part of the narration of Krishna and his devotees and preaching pure devotional service. Because material opulences are on the mind of most entities and the Bhagavatam literally is a guide to every single emotion, every single desire one could have. And what happens um, if that desire is wrongly uh, fulfilled or tried to be wrongly fulfilled? or if that desire is dovetailed in the service of Krishna, or if someone purely desires service to Krishna. So the Bhagavatam again and again gives us instances, you know, the famous story of Sudama and his wife. The wife is pushing Sudama to go and ask his friend Krishna for some money. Sudama and his wife are so poor it is described that they would go to bed shivering with hunger. And Sudama, in his younger days, had been in the ashram of Sandipani Muni along with Krishna, their guru, and they had become fast friends. But over time, their paths had become divergent. So Sudama, you know, went back to his village. He lived in a little tiny ramshackle hut with his wife. Krishna was the emperor and he lived in Dwarka in opulence, which the material world hasn't even, cannot even dream of. So their paths were very, very divergent. And Sudama would frequently think of his friend Krishna with fondness. And his wife was urging him, not for her own sake, but because she could not bear to see Sudama shivering with hunger, emaciated on the point of like dying maybe with the hunger. And so she keeps pushing him and makes all kinds of arguments. So she says, you know, you are a devotee of his. Um, he's the Supreme Lord. He can help you. And Sudama says, well, you know, that does it. I'm not really a devotee. You know, I have so many material desires. I'm not really a devotee, so I can't approach him. And, and then Sudama says, well, if I were actually a devotee, then why should I approach him for material opulences? He knows what, he's in my heart. He knows what my situation is. And his situation, this is the situation he's given us. So I'm very grateful for what he's given us. So then she says, um, 
but no, you were together in the Gurukula and you are friends with each other. You know, surely you can ask him as a friend. You know, a rich friend can surely help out a poor friend. And he goes, well, yeah, we were together in the Gurukula, but I mean, how can we be friends? He's the emperor of the universe and I'm just a tiny little Brahmin. So he's trying to counter all her arguments, but finally he sees that she's really distressed for him. And he thinks to himself, you know, he's a true devotee. So he thinks to himself, well, I'll go, but I won't ask him for anything. And he, he says, at least I'll get to see my beautiful friend, my beautiful Lord. And so he goes to Dwarka. And obviously you don't go to see a friend, um, even a regular friend, what to speak of the Supreme Lord, without taking something as an offering, but he has nothing in his house. So he takes these little chip packet of chipped rice, ties it in his dhoti, and he sets off. And it's described because Sudama would be begging uh, for all the food that he would get. Um, he had got rice, chipped rice, which not even the animals would eat. And it was third class, fourth class chipped rice. Because in India, when you know a beggar comes to the door, the householder doesn't give the best items to the beggar. They usually give what is rejected or you know unfit for consumption for themselves, and they give it to the beggar. So Sudama went to Dwarka. He was received with so much love and affection by Krishna. And when Sudama saw the opulences of Dwarka, he felt very ashamed that he did not have anything of value to offer to his friend. But Krishna is in his heart, like he's in all our hearts. And Krishna saw, he knew that he had, Sudama had brought something with him. So he snatched that packet of chip rice from him and took a mouth, took a handful and put it in his mouth. And the enjoyment it's described that Krishna got from eating it was so immense because he was tasting the love and the bhakti of Sudama, the exclusive devotion. He wasn't tasting that, you know, rancid, stale rice. He was tasting Sudama's bhakti. And he was about to reach for a second handful and Rukmini Devi, who is the goddess of fortune, she held Krishna's hand. She stopped him. And the Acharyas described that she stopped him because she is thinking already with this one handful that my Lord has eaten, I'm obligated to this Brahmana and I'm, I have to shower my blessings upon him. If Krishna eats any more of this rice, of this offering, I'm going to have to become this Brahmana's maidservant because, you know, Krishna is just getting so, he's feeling so uh, indebted to this Brahmana. So she stopped Krishna. And then Sudama did not ask Krishna for anything. So on his way back, uh, and Krishna didn't give him anything. So on the way back, you know, what is Sudama's mentality? Now, most of us, let's be honest, if we were dirt poor, that we were on the point of starvation, and we had a billionaire friend that we went to see, and the friend sees what kind of rags we are in, and you know, what's our situation, and he doesn't even give us like a few dollars in our hands, we might feel like a little put out, like, come on, like, couldn't you like give me something? You have billions. But Sudama had no such thought. It didn't even cross his mind. It's described that Sudama was so full of gratitude. He was thinking, my friend is so wonderful. He is protecting my bhakti. He knows that if I become opulent, I will become proud. And so he's not giving me any opulences at all. And so his heart is full of gratitude and he's thinking of Krishna with gratitude and he goes home. And of course, Krishna has turned his hovel into a magnificent palace and his wife into a young maiden and Sudama himself gets transformed into a young man and he gets untold opulences. Now, what is Krishna's thought when Sudama leaves? So Krishna is thinking to himself, I am so indebted to Sudama for his immense unconditional, complete surrender and bhakti. And I really have nothing to give him. All the opulences of this world are not enough to repay him for his bhakti. But still, I have to do something. I cannot bear to see him starve and be so poor. So Krishna does what he does. Now it's described, you know, that Sudama, now this is a favorite pastime of many, many people, um, whether devotees or non-devotees, because it's like a rags to riches story. And we all feel like, yeah, yeah, you know, I can handle mercy like Sudama got. But really, just reflect, Sudama got this mercy of 
extreme opulence because he was actually proud of his poverty. He was proud of his austerity, just a little, not a lot. And Krishna, if there is one thing that he wants to eradicate from our heart so that we can become completely pure, it is pride. For most of us, poverty does not bring pride. For most of us, extreme opulence brings pride. So when we turn to Krishna, our life is actually in Krishna's hand. It's controlled by his divine energy. And the goddess of fortune, Rama Devi, or you know, Muralidhar's Radharani, she actually takes charge of our life and she controls what happens in our lives simply so that we can become exclusively focused on her beloved Lord. And so we see Sudama, Mara, Sudama getting this extreme opulences, but then we also see Prahlad Maharaj, we see Dhruva Maharaj, we see Prithu Maharaj. They were all opulent and given huge kingdoms because Krishna knew that they would use those opulences in his service. The Shastra again and again tells us that the danger of opulence is material opulence is pride. And so this is why uh, the goddess of fortune, um, when we pray to her, please bless me. What we are actually praying, if we have turned to Krishna as devotees, what we are actually praying is, put me in a material situation that will be conducive to my advancement in bhakti. Sachinanda Swami um, gives a very nice prayer where he says, um, you know, we are, he's realistic about where many devotees are not yet, you know, 100% surrendered. He says we can pray to Krishna to protect us and maintain us materially and spiritually. And the protection comes in the form of Krishna arranging our material life in such a way that we can pursue bhakti without any kind of um, anxiety or an alteration of focus. And that does not mean always that we become rich. It just means that we are enabled to focus on our bhakti with whatever Krishna is giving us. So Bhagavatam tells us, and so do the other scriptures, Chaitanya Bhagavat repeatedly talks about it too, that one who is intelligent does not strive for anything that is available in this material world. We were listening to a chapter in Chaitanya Bhagavat yesterday where um, Mahaprabhu he is saying, he's asking the, um, the pilgrims who have come with him on their journey to Jagannath Puri, um, did you bring anything with, with you? Any money, any, any kinds of goods and possessions? And the pilgrim said, no. And he said, good, good. He said, whatever the Supreme Lord wants will come to us automatically anyway. We don't have to worry. All we have to do is to <coughs> serve Krishna. So yes, you know, as we, as devotees, as Grihastha devotees, we live in society, we live in different aspects of society. Some of us might be artists or lawyers or students or whatever. And everyone needs examples to look up to for something that they could become. So we all have varying degrees of opulences that are given to us by uh, the Supreme Lord and his consort, Rama Devi. And as long as we remember the lessons of the Bhagavatam, and specifically this chapter, as to using whatever we have, whatever little or whatever much we have, to serve Krishna with our body, mind, words, and with our entire life, then we will be safe and we will actually get Rama Devi's true favor. So I want to stop here and ask for comments, corrections, reflections, anything. Hare Krishna, Adi Purusha Prabhu. Hare Krishna, wonderful class. Very, you know, perfect and very satisfying. Satang Satangang Mamabiriya Bambita. It says that to hear the discourse of the Sat, the pure devotee, is very satisfying to the ear and pleasing to the heart. So we, we feel very satisfied by your wonderful class. And you made some really good points about how we're supposed to use whatever we have. People may be <clears throat> um, in possession of various facility, but Krishna is so wonderful. We try to remember that the Bhagavatam is to glorify Krishna. Krishna is so wonderful that anyone, no matter who they are, where they are, what their facility, anyone can please Krishna. 
if they do their best under the circumstances they're in, if they do their best, Krishna sees that this person is trying to please me. Mm. How wonderful. And, they, and Krishna is satisfied by that loving offering. The Sudama offered what appeared to be very little, but it was his humble best. Mm. And, and, you know, you may have other, you know, degrees of responsibility based on our station in life. But anyone can remember that the goal is to please Krishna and anyone can try to do that. Krishna, see, that's how we're successful. Everyone can be successful now. Mm. How wonderful is Krishna? Well, glory yeah. to Shri Prabhupada. Jai yeah, Shri Prabhupada. Thank you. Yeah, I was simply trying to repeat the words of the pure devotee, Shri Prabhupada. So hey. if there was anything in the class that people liked, then um, it was all because of his words. If there are mistakes, obviously they are my mistakes. Mm-hmm. Anyone mm-hmm. else? Comment or question? Thank you, Namras Prabhu. Yeah. Hi, Krishna. Thank Hi, Krishna. you. Hari Bol. Oh, all throughout the class, I was, I was thinking about a friend I have who might as well be me because I would be reacting the same way as she's right now. Mm-hmm. And this friend, she is um, charitable to Krishna consciousness. She used to be a regular at the Bhakti Center, but for a certain, you know, certain stop going. Anyway, she's in a position where it seems like Lakshmi Devi has forsaken her, you know, in in all in all respects, you know, she, you know, she, she all of her material support systems seem to be leaving her. So she feels that Krishna has actually forgotten her address. <laughs> so, you know, listening to a class like this. It would be hard for her to see how um, to be inspired actually to want nothing but to serve Krishna. You know, she wouldn't, you know, it's even difficult for me to relate to Sudama, mm. you know. So, how to encourage a person who, who is in this materially very challenging situation to, to, to be you know, to use everything that they have in Krishna's service when it doesn't seem like Krishna is interested in them. Mm. Yeah, it's a wonderful, that's Gail, right? It's, it's a wonderful question. So um, it, is, it is definitely challenging and we have one minute left. My, my um, reflection on this would be that we do what we can to help uh, people like this but if we can help materially, we can help materially, you know, that can mean introducing them to potential, you know, uh, leads where they can get a job or, you know, help them financially. But above all, we should be there to encourage them and just be there as support, hear them, hear their woe, try to empathize. And also, that's the reason why Krishna says, Patram Pushpam Palam Toyam. You know, Krishna doesn't say, give me opulences like palaces and cars and jewels and, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars. Krishna says, give me a, you know, water, fruit, flower, a leaf, which is within the realm of the poorest of the poor to offer. And the other thing is, you know, that we do bhakti um, to satisfy Krishna, not to get something in return. And yes, most of us, myself included, are not at that stage. That is our ideal, but we are not at that stage. And so a certain amount of material opulence is necessary. But I don't have a ready answer other than, you know, be there as a friend, try to help her in every way you can. And, you know, feed her prasad. That way, at least there is a connection to Krishna, even if her other practices are not working right now, uh, or she's unwilling to do them. Um, And over time, she will feel the mercy of Krishna through your loving actions in her life. So anyway, we are at the time I'm seeing. uh,